All right, so let's start our discussion of what are some of the characteristics of living organisms. Um, the video that you watched prior to going to this, uh, the guy that makes those are the biology teachers somewhere, and he makes phenomenal videos. Um, so I'll be showing quite a bit of his stuff over the course of the semester, uh, usually as the introduction to each unit. And so, um, like I said, his videos are my favorite YouTube videos out there. So. Um, you're going to be seeing a lot more of this stuff. And, and hopefully it's not just me that that was pretty good. And I have no idea how I'm going to follow that up because my presentation is not nearly as good as what um, he just had. So um, as you've probably figured out, I'm home with my daughter again. Hopefully things will be better soon. And I'm thinking I should be back in school uh, tomorrow. So we'll get caught up on things. Tomorrow we'll be ready. We'll start talking about microscopes and doing some things. I am still planning on their first quiz being Friday. So please be aware your first quiz is going to be Friday and it's going to cover the, the scientific inquiry stuff and the parts of a, a lab and the, um, what goes into a lab report. What do you need in terms of good experimental design, identifying your variables and things of that sort. So be ready for your first quiz on Friday. And we'll take some time tomorrow to, to review all this. All right, so let's start by looking at some of the characteristics of living organisms. One of those characteristics is not the ability to read, even though it looks like that's what uh, this pen is doing. I believe that's a Scrabble tile. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's a Scrabble tile that's been uh, scratched up pretty good. So um, you can see some living organisms here as well. Uh, Mickey Mouse, definitely one of the, the greatest living organisms there is out there, unfortunately you got to look behind the mask to find where the living organism is. Uh, this is one of my favorite family pictures because of the fact uh, this is the first time we were at Disney. This was the first time, uh, first thing we went to the first time we went to Disney. And you can see my daughter looking at Minnie, or excuse me, at Mickey saying, uh, how the heck did you get out of my TV screen and stand here next to me? So I don't know if she's scared, if she's excited or what. My son, he's, he's just awesome. Uh, my beautiful wife. And then you'll notice that I am one of the few people in the world that can rock the fanny pack. So um, don't even try it, guys. Don't, don't get out fanny packs. Don't even try to look better in it than I do because uh, it's not going to work. And generally, you don't want to wear a fanny pack anyway. I threw that thing out as soon as I got home so that I never had to wear it again. All right. So when we talk about characteristics of living things, and uh, it was alluded to in the video, no single characteristic is enough to describe a living thing. We talk about is it the ability to move. Ability to move is not one of the characteristics of living things. However, he also talked about the ability to reproduce. Being able to reproduce is one of the characteristics. He talked about, um, uh, what was the other one that was in there? Oh, being able to uh, react to your surroundings, being able to, to respond to your environment. That is one of the characteristics of living things. But you need to have all of these characteristics in order to be classified as a living organism. All right, so in some cases, you're going to have non-living things that are going to share one or more of these traits. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, if you haven't figured it out, you should be taking notes on this. This, vi or this video will be posted on the blog. It's also going to be the PowerPoint is in the, the wiki, but uh, this is a note-taking session, so you should have your notebooks out, and you should be going through and taking notes on these, on these things. All right, so the eight characteristics of living things, so all living organisms need to have all eight of these characteristics are they need to be made up of what we call cells. Hopefully you've heard that term before. They have to have the ability to reproduce on their own. They have to be uh, based upon a universal genetic code. That universal genetic code is what we call DNA. It's also um, RNA. And then it has to have the ability to grow and develop. You got some nice MSU uh, music going in the background here. Has to have the ability to obtain and use um, materials and energy. So it has to be able to take in food in some way or some other energy source in some way and be able to use it uh, to its advantage. It needs to have the ability to respond to its environment. Has to be able to also maintain a stable internal environment. You're going to hear me use a, a fancy schmancy term called homeostasis. So it has to be able to uh, maintain homeostasis. And it has to have the ability to change over time. So in order for a living organism to be considered living, it has to have these eight things. And basically, guys, what I'm getting at right now is the fact that this is going to be the basis for this entire class. Everything we do in this class is going to somehow relate to one of these eight bullets. 
And so we'll be coming back to this PowerPoint. This is essentially the first biology PowerPoint we're doing. This is also going to be the last one because I want to be able to prove my point at the end of the semester that we've discussed and took time to look at all of these, except for we're not going to spend much time on the change over time because you're supposed to have done that uh, in your eighth grade earth science class. All right, so let's take a few minutes. We're going to look at just each, each of these uh, characteristics individually for just a moment, and then we're going to move on and call it a day. All right, so living things are made up of cells. All right, the cell is nothing more than the smallest unit of an organism that can be considered alive. So it's a single functional unit that has the ability to maintain all the processes that are necessary for life to continue. <coughs> <coughs> One thing you should notice with cells, when you look at plant cells, you notice the plant cell has more of a boxy shape. This is going to be more of a rectangular or square shape to it. That's a result of a structure called the cell wall, and we'll talk about that when we get into cells. And then uh, animal cells are going to have more of a circular shape, and they're going to be much more flexible, uh, which helps to explain why many animals move, whereas plants do not. All right, so characteristic number one is being able to recognize that living things are made with cells, and that the cell is a single unit of an organism that can be uh, considered alive, excuse me, the smallest single unit of an organism that can be considered to be alive. Let's look at the next one then. Uh, living things have to have the ability to reproduce. There's really two types of reproduction. Uh, there's sexual reproduction, which involves cells from two different parents uniting to form uh, the first cell of the new organism. There's also then going to be an asexual reproduction, which is going to be slightly different. So sexual reproduction is what us humans use. Um, you have to have an egg cell, you have a sperm cell. When those two unite, it will then be the start of a new organism. So they can reproduce sexually. And there's different names for different methods for sexual reproduction. And we won't get into that, uh, most likely. Um, but you, you might run into it if you choose to take, well, you will run into it if you choose to take AP biology. And then there's asexual reproduction, where a single parent is going to produce the offspring and the offspring are going to be identical to itself. So one of the big differences with sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction is sexual reproduction, all the organisms that are made as a result of it are going to be different from one another. You don't look the same as your brothers and sisters because of things that happen as a result of um, the sperm and egg cell getting made and then things that happen as a result of the two of those combining together. That's good for you because you don't want to look like your brothers and sisters because you all, you all look better than your brothers and sisters. Um, asexual reproduction, if we reproduced asexually, we'd all look like our parents, and our parents would look like our grandparents. And essentially, when you go through the whole uh, chain of evolution, we'd all look the same. That's not pretty, because that means most of you guys would look like me, and that's not good for you. Right? And so you can see an example of asexual reproduction here. And this is the way that, mo that single-celled organisms are going to uh, reproduce. It goes through a series of changes. Um, the little dot here is the DNA, so the DNA gets copied, and eventually the cell splits into two identical cells. So living things have to have this ability to reproduce. Uh, I was doing a little bit of research yesterday to help out with biology. Um, I was watching house episodes because it relates to biology, and uh, they were talking about they had a part, and I couldn't find the clip. I was going to include it in here, but um, nobody's posted it at all. Uh, there was a part where they talked about, there's this lady they went into the clinic, and um, she said that she's an asexual individual. And so um, the, Dr. Wilson was looking at her like, eh, that's not possible. I'm laughing because I realize it's not possible. But then I, I guess when I did a little more research on it, I found out that um, they are starting to consider asexual to be one of the sexual orientations. So it can be heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, or asexual. And the asexual, they're saying that that means that they don't have the um, physical characteristics that make them want to go through the process of reproduction. And so uh, some people are coining that as a as an actual scientific term uh, to describe humans as a biologist. I don't know if I can really buy into that. All right. So then, characteristics of living things. Uh, continued. It's going to be, you're going to look at the fact that living things have the ability to grow and develop. So what you can see here is you have a seed, and when the conditions are right, the seed starts to sprout. So you're seeing the roots starting to develop, 
the leaves starting to develop. You can see the uh, root hair starting to come off from the main root to increase the surface area so it's easier for it to absorb things from the soil and uh, the cell is going to continue to grow and develop. This picture here is showing a nerve cell and then this picture here is showing a red blood cell. All right, at some point during development, cells are going to do what we call differentiation, which means the cells are going to start to be designed to make or, or to perform a specialized task. So cell differentiation, cell specialization are essentially the same thing. So when you started out, and I, I should have thrown some pictures in here, um, when you were first made, so when the sperm from dad and the egg from mom came together, what happened was first you start out as one cell, then the one cell becomes two, the two cells become four, four become eight, so on and so forth. Well, those first original cells were all exactly the same. At some point during development, is somewhere around the 256 cell stage, some of those cells start to reprogram, and instead of being the, the same type of cells, which we call stem cells, which I'm hoping you guys have heard people talk about, those stem cells will start to change and become specialized cells, and so one of those stem cells may develop to become part of the right arm. Another one of the cells may develop to become part of the left arm, so on and so forth. One of them develops to be, uh, become the head. And so they start to eventually differentiate. So that is a term I would like you to be familiar with, the, the term differentiation. That's right. So differentiate just means to start performing its own specialized task. Right, and that's part of growth and development. The fourth characteristic I want to uh, identify is that all living things are based upon a universal genetic code. This shouldn't be new to you. You guys have heard of DNA. All right, that's what we mean by universal genetic code. The DNA, or the molecules that make up the DNA in us, are the exact same as the molecules that make up the DNA in every other living organism. The differences are the amount of DNA, and the arrangement of the what we call the nucleotides on the DNA, the inner rungs here. In every living organism, this outer chain is exactly the same. You have sugars and phosphates. It's the arrangement of the inside that makes every living organism different from one another. All right, so every living organism has to have DNA or some sort of um, genetic code. That can then be, and that genetic code is important for two reasons. One, it's the way that you pass on the genes to the next generation. That's the one that we most often think of when we hear DNA. But the other thing is, is the DNA is really the recipe for making proteins in your body. Right? So your body, your cell has ways of taking and reading the message that's inside the DNA and then taking out to the place where proteins get made and then the proteins get made. And the proteins are really the things that cause you to have all the characteristics that you have. Um, the proteins, though, are a result of the recipe inside the DNA. So I liken it to a cookbook. You have the DNA, which is the, the big cookbook, and then you have the, uh, the individual recipe is like the protein. And so you're going to go through, you, you find in the cookbook the recipe that you need, and we call that recipe a gene. So you find the gene that you need, and then the gene has all the instructions for how to make that substance. And so you take all those raw ingredients, mix them together, and in the end you have this um, protein that will now perform a, a specialized task. And so all living things need to have a universal genetic code. Things have to have the ability to obtain materials and use energy. All right, we have a name for that. You've heard about your metabolism. That's what metabolism really is. It's the combination of the chemical reactions that happen within your cells. Well, the, the majority of the chemical reactions happening in your cells that make up your metabolism are dealing with obtaining materials that are necessary, so the nutrients that you need to survive, and then being able to get energy from uh, things that you're bringing into your body, or uh, in the plant's case, being able to take and make food using energy from the sun, and turn around and then take that food and get the energy that it needs from it. So what you can see here is this is the process in, that happens inside your cell uh, inside a structure called the mitochondria, or in which you are able to um, get energy that can then be used by your cells to be able to do work. Next thing, living things have to be able to respond to their environment. All right, um, a couple of terms you should be familiar with. You should know what a stimulus is. A stimulus is a signal. 
that uh, an organism will respond to, and then the response is your reaction to it. So, in this picture here, <clears throat> excuse me, person touches the hot pan. That's the stimulus. It's hot. Then the response is, you can see the hand being removed from the pan. So you have a stimulus, the pan is hot, the response, let go of the pan. All right, other ex another example of this, if you want something fun to do and your mom or dad has been getting on your case telling you you can no longer torture your brother or sister, you can start torturing your plants. I love playing this trick on my plants. All right, you can see this plant here. It's responding to its environment. The plant is leaning towards its source of sunlight. So if you really want to be mean to your plants, what you can do is take that pot, turn it 180 degrees. So now the plant is facing away from the sun. And then just let it sit for, for a couple weeks. And you might be surprised by what you see happen. Because over the next couple weeks, and in some plants it's going to be quicker, and some plants it's going to take more time than that. But eventually, the plant's going to reposition itself and lean once again towards the, uh, the sunlight because that's the stimulus. It wants that, and so the response is let's get as close to that as we can so that we can get more of the energy from that. So, um, like I said, try that trick on your plants at home. <coughs> Another characteristic, living things have to be able to maintain a stable internal environment. The fancy schmancy name for that in um, biology is homeostasis. So plant or plant and animals and fungi and protista, well I guess we shouldn't really say protista anymore because they're kind of spread through everything else. And then uh, your bacteria, those all have to have the ability to maintain homeostasis in some way. So they need to have a way of keeping the conditions inside the organism at a constant, um, it could be rate, the constant level, whatever uh, it is that you're dealing with. The most common th thing you hear about when you're talking about homeostasis is you hear people talking about body temperature. And so we'll relate homeostasis to body temperature. We'll also spend some time when we get to that unit looking at how your body regulates um, blood sugar. You know, so um, you're going to have a discussion about diabetes with that. Look at how it regulates the amount of water, <coughs> how it regulates the, the pH levels in the blood. We'll spend some time, we'll look at a lot of different uh, examples of that. Most of the time when we're talking about homeostasis, it uses a process called negative feedback, and uh, that's what we're showing here. All right, so you can see here the normal body temperature is supposed to be 37 degrees Celsius. When the body temperature gets too high, it causes something to happen. Then that causes something else to happen to dro drop the body temperature. This loop will continue to happen until you get back to 37 degrees. So as the body temperature is up, this is going to keep happening, it's going to keep happening. When the body temperature gets lower than 37 degrees, a different mechanism happens. Now the nervous system has a different trigger that happens. It's going to cause a response, and this response is meant to help bring the temperature back up. Well, as long as the temperature continues to stay lower than it's supposed to be, this little loop will continue to happen. When the body temperature is just right, neither of these loops are happening. So, once again, that's why it's called a feedback loop. <coughs> we'll spend some time looking at this. And this is very similar to the thermostat inside your house. When it gets too hot, the air conditioner kicks on, which will bring the temperature down. And once it reaches the temperature it's supposed to be at, it kicks off. When the temperature gets too cold in the house, the furnace kicks on. Once the furnace uh, gets the temperature up to the uh, desired temperature, it gets kicked back off. And so, once again, be familiar with the term feedback loop because we're going to talk about that quite a bit. And then finally, uh, as a group, living things have to have the ability to change over time. So, um, and this is going to happen over many, many, many generations in most cases. All right, I, I know some people, oh, the word evolution, oh, it's such a mean, nasty term. No, it's not. You cannot deny the term evolution. And the term evolution means uh, the change in a group of organisms over time. Everything changes. Nobody can deny that. And, um, no religious figure can deny that. Uh, no parent, no community member. You can't deny it. If you went to your, your priest or your rabbi, your pastor, whoever, and asked them, does evolution occur? Many of them do have a solid knowledge in science, and they, write, or they will answer you, yes, it does occur. Where the controversy comes in is the mechanism in which that occurs. 
you know, is it a spiritual being that's causing all these changes uh, with the plan, or is it random changes that are happening as a result of various things? That's where the debate comes into play. So um, things do change over time. Evolution does happen. All right, so you can see an example of that here. Uh, one of the most common um, topics when you talk about evolution is the changes in a horse that have occurred over time because we have a very good fossil record that dates back about uh, 60 million years on the horse, and we've seen many changes in the horse organism over time. You can see that the original horse called the Eohippus actually had four toes, but it lived in a different environment than what it lives in today. It lived in a more marshy environment, and so having those four, to four toes gave it an advantage. It could move better in, the, um, in that environment. <coughs> but gradually over time, the horses started to move into a more um, grassy areas, and so the development of the, of the hoof gave it an advantage to have that harder compacted uh, hoof for the harder compacted ground. And so you can see the changes that have occurred in the foot of the horse over time. You can also look at other things with the horse. You can look at the mouth. You can look at the teeth. Or you can look at the size as well. All right, so that walks you through the eight characteristics of living things. The next thing I want you to work on is... Um, you have this assignment. What I want you to do is I want you to draw or to write a letter to Igor. Right? You're Dr. Frankenstein. You need to make this brand new living monster. All right? You're quite rushed to do it. You can't do it because you got to take off and uh, take care of some other things. So you're leaving it up to Igor. And so you're going to write a letter to Igor explaining what he needs to do in order to make it so that your your monster that he creates is living. All right, let me give you a, a hint with this. The answers are not, it needs to have a heart. It needs to have a brain. It needs to have kidneys. It needs to have this. Those are not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for are, are six of the characteristics that were just covered in that PowerPoint. All right, so it needs to have the ability to reproduce. It needs to have the ability uh, to adapt over, or evolve over time. It has to have... Um, the ability to, uh, it has to be composed of cells. All right, so I want you to write a letter to Igor explaining those things. Well, you need to pick six of the eight um, characteristics. There's no extra credit for doing eight of the eight. Um, in each case, I want you to explain why. On your paper, this should be bolded. It should be underlined because this is where most people lose their points. Not only are you identifying the characteristics that they need to have, you need to explain why each of those characteristics is important. And then um, I want you to do a word count for me. You should have at least 200 words in your in your letter. These are going to be due on Friday. We'll take the time. If anybody wants to read theirs to the class, they'll have the ability to do so. And um, we'll review this a little bit more on Friday. All right. At this point, uh, I believe that's it for the class. Uh, take the rest of the time to write your papers. They don't have to be typed. They can be handwritten. If you have anything else that you have not completed uh, for the class, please get that done before tomorrow. All right. Have a good day, everybody. See you tomorrow.